England farmer and attorney at law, reluctant proponent of independence from Great Britain, holder of high office and defender of the rule of law. This describes John Adams, but only scratches the surface of his character, his ideals, and his legacy. John Adams was born in 1735 in Baintree, modern Quincy, Massachusetts, some 10 miles southeast of Boston. His parents were descended from Puritans, and the Adams family were prominent members, their pew located immediately left of the pulpit. At age 16, John entered Harvard College, earning his degree in 1755. Among his professors at Harvard was the mathematician and scientist John Winthrop. One indication of the respect shown for Winthrop's scientific accomplishments is that his paper on the movement of Halley's Comet was read by Benjamin Franklin before the Royal Society in London. Following graduation from Harvard, John accepted a teaching position in Worcester, Massachusetts, some 50 miles west and south of Boston. In Worcester, he was introduced to the doctrines of Voltaire and the French Deus, but also to the doctrines of what he referred to as the frigid John Calvin. As a teacher, he did his best to offer his pupils an enlightened educational experience. His time with young students brought him to conclude, Human nature is more easily wrought upon and governed by promises and encouragement and praise than by punishment and threatening and blame. From the library of his landlord, he studied works on theology. He became a member of the small circle of intellectuals in Worcester and found with delight that he could hold his own with older, learned men on matters of the practical world. He soon made a decision to study for the law and secured an apprenticeship with Worcester attorney James Putnam in 1756. When not in front of his pupils, John now absorbed the works of Edward Coke and other legal scholars. In the fall of 1758, John completed his apprenticeship with James Putnam and returned home to Baintree and a fierce competition among lawyers for available legal business. He sought the guidance and patronage of Boston lawyer Jeremiah Gridley, who was not only the most respected member of the bar, but also Grand Master of the Freemasons and a colonel in the Massachusetts militia. Gridley offered the young man good advice. One is to pursue the study of the law rather than the gain of it. Pursue the gain of it enough to keep out of the buyers, but give your main attention to the study of it. The next is not to marry early, for an early marriage will obstruct your improvement, and in the next place it will involve you in expense. With the support of Gridley, John was soon admitted to the Massachusetts Bar. Slowly he built a law practice, yet he admitted to distractions, writing in his journal, Laziness, languor, inattention are my bane. I am too lazy to rise early and make a fire, and when my fire is made at ten o'clock, my passion for knowledge, fame, fortune, or any good is too languid to make me apply with spirit to my book, and my mind is liable to be called off from the law by a girl, a pipe, a poem, a love letter, a spectator, a play. When his father died of influenza in May of 1761, John inherited the family's farm in Braintree. Now owning property, he acquired the greater political rights attached to being a freeholder of land. His first election to public office came shortly thereafter as surveyor of highways, a responsibility for which he had no training to that point. He soon met and courted Abigail Smith of Weymouth, interrupted prior to their marriage by John's decision to be inoculated against smallpox, 
which in that time meant deliberately contracting the disease, hoping for eventual immunity. Abigail's own health was never good, leading historian Paige Smith to observe, Simply considering the health of the bride and groom, it was not a promising match. Abigail was almost a chronic invalid, racked by migraine headaches, unaccountable fevers, and persistent insomnia. John, a food faddist and seldom free of some nagging complaint, had already resigned himself to an early death. John's desire for public acclaim took a step forward in August of 1765 with the publication of four articles submitted anonymously to the Boston Gazette and later reprinted in the London Chronicle with the title, True Sentiments of America. He succinctly described what he and others embraced as the principles upon which the British colonies in North America were founded. With toil and fatigue, perhaps not to be conceived by their brethren and fellow subjects at home, and with the constant peril of their lives from a numerous, savage, and warlike race of men, they began their settlement, and God prospered them. They obtained a charter from King Charles I, wherein His Majesty was pleased to grant them and their heirs and assigns forever all the lands therein described to hold of him and his royal successors in free and common suckage, which we humbly conceive is absolute in a state as the subject can hold under the crown. And in the same charter were granted to them and their posterity all the rights, liberties, privileges, and immunities of natural subjects born within the realm. This charter they enjoyed, having, as we most humbly conceive, punctually complied with all the conditions of it, till in an unhappy time it was vacated. But after the Revolution, when King William and Queen Mary, of glorious and blessed memory, were established on the throne, in that happy reign, when to the joy of the nation and its dependencies the crown was settled in your majesty's illustrious family, the inhabitants of this province shared in the common blessing. And then Adams reached what he believed was the logical conclusion of this trust. Then they were indulged with another charter in which their majesties were pleased for themselves, their heirs and successors, to grant and confirm to them as ample a state in the lands or territories as was granted by the former charter, together with other the most essential rights and liberties contained therein. The principle of which is that which your majesty's subjects within the realm have ever held a most sacred right, of being taxed only by representatives of their own free election. Adams expressed his belief that the power of those who govern is limited by, quote, equity and reason, unquote. I say rights, for such they have, undoubtedly, antecedent to all earthly government rights that cannot be repealed or retrained by human law, rights derived from the great legislator of the universe. Before long, John Adams was drawn into the thick of the protests by Boston Sons of Liberty and other citizens against new taxes imposed by Britain. On the 26th of August, 1765, a mob surrounded and virtually destroyed the home and possessions of the Lieutenant Governor, Thomas Hutchinson. In the fall of 1765, John prepared his town's response to the Stamp Act. What he wrote was soon reprinted in periodicals throughout Massachusetts. Unwilling to comply with the Stamp Act, the people of Massachusetts brought the colony to an administrative and economic standstill. As the new year of 1766 began, John wrote this in his journal. 
We are now upon the beginning of a year of greater expectation than any that has passed before it. This year brings ruin or salvation to the British colonies. The eyes of all America are fixed on the British Parliament. In short, Britain and America are staring at each other, and they will probably stare more and more for some time. Championed by William Pitt, the Stamp Act was repealed by Parliament, but the colonies were warned. that king, lord, and commons have an undoubted right to make laws for the colonies in all cases whatsoever. The principle was one of virtual representation. In 1770 came John's defense of the British captain and his soldiers indicted for murder of colonials killed at the so-called Boston Massacre. To his surprise, in the aftermath of the trial and acquittal of the British soldiers, John was elected a delegate to the general court from Boston. As is the case with so many of the literate and thoughtful people of his time, John Adams revealed much in his correspondence. To Isaac Smith he wrote, I see that my countrymen, the Americans, have not the virtue, the fortitude, the magnanimity to resist these encroachments to a decisive effect. And a bit later, as the tensions increased, he added, I said there was no more justice left in Britain than there was in hell, that I wished for war, and that the whole Bourbon family was upon the back of Great Britain avowed a thorough disaffection to that country, wished that anything might happen to them, that they might be brought to reason or to ruin. During the night of the 3rd of November, 1773, Bostonians boarded the ship the Dartmouth and dumped its cargo of tea into the bay. John Adams recorded his excitement at the turn of events. This is the most magnificent movement of all. There is a dignity, a majesty, a sublimity in this last effort of the patriots that I greatly admire. The people should never rise without doing something to be remembered, something notable and striking. This destruction of the tea is so bold, so daring, so firm, intrepid and inflexible, and it must have so important consequences and so lasting that I can't but consider it as an epic in history. In response, King George III ordered a heavy hand. Lord North signed a bill closing the harbor of Boston to all trade. Town meetings were prohibited, and the royal governor given what amounted to dictatorial powers, if they could be enforced. Four regiments of British infantry and three of artillery arrived and set up camp on the Boston Commons. The newly appointed governor, General Thomas Gage, now had the means to re-establish British authority. The Massachusetts Assembly moved from Boston to Salem, and there resolved to call a Continental Congress in September at Philadelphia. John Adams was elected as one of five delegates. On the 2nd of September, Adams and the other delegates who had thus far arrived met at City Tavern. Writing to Abigail, John took time to compare Philadelphia and its citizens with Boston and its citizens. The morals of our people are much better. Their manners are more polite and agreeable, but they are pure English. Our language is better. Our persons are handsomer. Our spirit is greater. Our laws are wiser. Our religion is superior. Our education is better. We exceed them in everything but in a market and in charitable public foundations. At the end of September, John put forward a resolution that, if adopted, would unite the colonies with Massachusetts. Resolved 
that Massachusetts and the town of Boston are now struggling in the common cause of American freedom, and therefore that it is the indispensable duty of all the colonies to support them by every necessary means and to the last extremity. The main accomplishment of this first Continental Congress was the so-called Olive Branch Petition addressed to the King. The petition represented a final attempt by the moderates in the colonies to avoid a war of independence against Great Britain. As John Adams knew would occur, King George III discarded the petition and determined to use force to subdue his rebellious subjects. John soon thereafter left Philadelphia for his home in Braintree. He now began to write an explanation of events leading to the First Continental Congress and the basis for colonial resistance to parliamentary authority. These essays were published under the pen name Novanglis in the Boston Gazette. The events of one day the 19th of April, 1775, removed any realistic hope of a negotiated settlement of the disputes. Blood on both sides was spilled at Lexington and Concord in Massachusetts. News of the fighting at Lexington and Concord spread throughout the colonies, and a second Continental Congress was called again in Philadelphia. John Adams was returned as a delegate. In preparation, he had undertaken a study of the history of confederated governments. What Adams realized was that, at least for the time being, the rebellious colonials were on their own in the fight against the powerful British Empire. God helps those who help themselves, and it has ever appeared to me since this unhappy dispute began that we had no friend upon the earth to depend on but the resources of our own country and the good sense and great virtues of our people. We shall finally be obliged to depend upon ourselves. High on his list of priorities for the colonies was for each to establish its own system of government. In Congress, he moved that every state be instructed to begin work on a written constitution. As historian Page Smith observed, The opportunity was irresistible to a philosopher-politician, and Adams, his head full of Harrington, Sidney, Hobbes, and Locke, as well as a dozen continental theorists, set to work to put his own views of government in order. Adams embraced the opportunity history was providing to the people of North America, but he was far from certain they would make the most of it. He wrote, I have seen all my life such selfishness and littleness even in New England that I sometimes tremble to think that, although we are engaged in the best cause that ever employed the human heart, Yet the prospect of success is doubtful, not for want of power or of wisdom, but of virtue. When Thomas Paine's pamphlet Common Sense appeared in January of 1776 and captured the public's imagination, John applauded its appeal, but was not convinced by its arguments. To one correspondent, he wrote, the Old Testament reasoning against monarchy would have never come from me. The attempt to frame a continental constitution is feeble indeed. It is poor and despicable. Yet this is a very meritorious production. In point of argument, there is nothing new. Adams feared that the call for independence was as yet premature that a general commitment to a proper form of governance had not yet arisen. There must be a decency and respect and veneration introduced for persons in authority of every rank, or we are undone. In a popular government, this is the only way to supporting order. 
and in our circumstances, as we people have been so long without any government at all, it is more necessary than in any other. In this time of uncertainty, Adams feared the rise of men of modest ability and worse, an opportunistic attitude regarding public office. Adams was asked by two of the delegates from North Carolina for his recommendations on the form government ought to take. Eventually, this manuscript was published with the title, Thoughts on Government. In this document, Adams declared, Nothing is more certain from the history of nations and the nature of man than that some forms of government are better fitted for being well administered than others. For Adams, this required a republican form of government, a government directed by clear and just law, with representatives elected to serve in an assembly from which a council would be chosen and a governor elected to counter their natural inclinations. To all the vices, follies, and frailties of an individual, subject to fits of humor, starts of passion, fights of enthusiasm, partialities or prejudice, and consequently productive of hasty results and absurd judgments. If at some point the states determined to adopt a continental constitution, he argued for representative body only, with powers over war, trade, disputes between state and state, the post office, and the distribution of unsettled lands. To make this system work, however, required an educated citizenry. Education produces a greater difference between man and man than nature has made between man and brute. The virtues and powers to which men may be trained by early education and constant discipline are truly sublime and astonishing. Yet education alone was not sufficient in his mind to justify full and equal rights to all. It is certain in theory that the only moral foundation of government is the consent of the people. To what an extent shall we carry this principle? Shall we say that every individual of the community, old and young, male and female, as well as rich and poor, must consent expressly to every act of legislation? This is manifestly impossible. From whence then arises the right of the majority to bind the minority. Power always follows property. Men in general, who are wholly destitute of property, are also too little acquainted with public affairs to form a right judgment, and too dependent upon other men to have a will of their own. In response to the resolves adopted by Virginia's Convention, that the Congress should declare that these United States are and of right ought to be free and independent states. Adams urged action, but others were reticent and resolved to postpone a vote on independence until the 1st of July. Adams joined Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, Roger Sherman, and Robert Livingston on a five-man committee to draft the Declaration of Independence. Even as the colonies were in the process of becoming independent states, Adams remained worried about the ability of the new governments to govern. I fear we shall find that popular elections are not oftener determined upon pure principles of merit, virtue, and public spirit than the nominations of a court, if we do not take care. I fear there is an infinity of corruption in our elections already crept in. A popular government is the worst curse to which human nature can be devoted when it is thoroughly corrupted. Despotism is better. Representatives of the 13 states were attempting to conduct war and perform the functions of government without formal authority. 
Articles of Confederation were drafted by a committee established on the 12th of July, 1776, and an approved version was sent to the states in November of 1777, but not fully ratified by the states until March of 1781. John Adams was coming to the conclusion that the nation required a strong national government with appropriate powers granted to the legislative, executive, and judicial branches, but with checks and balances on those powers. The Congress sent John to France to assist Benjamin Franklin with the task of cementing relations and obtaining greater assistance. Here in France, he had no reputation to precede him. The French knew of Samuel Adams and Thomas Paine, but not John Adams. He wrote, probably to Abigail, I am inclined to think that all parties, both in France and England, Whigs and Tories in England, the friends of Franklin, Dean and Lee in France, differing in many other things, agreed in this that I was not the famous Adams, that I was a man of whom nobody had ever heard before, a perfect cipher, a man who did not understand a word of French, awkward in his figure, awkward in his dress, no abilities, perfect bigot, and fanatic. Of France, he observed this. The fields of grain, the vineyards, the castles, the cities, the parks, the gardens, everything is beautiful, yet every place swarms with beggars. And yet he found considerable pleasure in the company of some of the world's great thinkers, for example, the Abbe Renal, who would write a history of the American Revolution without access to any source documents in North America. as well as the French Minister of Finance and leader of the Physiocratic School, Anne Robert Jacques Turgot and others. Relieved of his assignment in France, John returned to North America and Massachusetts in time to learn of the defeat of a proposed state constitution. His fellow citizens wanted to remain free of government, which they were convinced was the only way to secure their newfound liberties. Conservative, propertied men, John Adams among them, saw only anarchy and chaos as the inevitable result. John joined with others, determined to create a constitutional government for Massachusetts. At the state convention in September of 1779, he set about the task of drafting a declaration of rights and a frame of government. Debate began late in October and continued until March of 1780. With stronger language added concerning religious freedom, the Constitution became law. In the preamble, John drew on the heritage of the great political philosophers. The end of the institution, maintenance, and administration of government is to secure the existence of the body politic to protect it, and to furnish the individuals who compose it with the power of enjoying, in safety and tranquility, their natural rights and the blessing of life. And whenever these great objects are not obtained, the people have a right to alter the government and to take measures necessary for their safety, happiness, and prosperity. Massachusetts would have, as John Adams urged, a two-house legislature, a strong chief executive, and an independent judiciary. There would be property requirements to exercise the franchise, but this was sufficiently low to allow most males over age 21 to qualify. Only a man of the Christian faith and considerable wealth could stand for election to the office of governor. He completed his draft near the end of October 1779. A month later, he left Massachusetts to assume the office of Minister Plenipotentiary in Europe. A 
The Commonwealth of Massachusetts formally adopted the state constitution in 1780, which excluded African Americans and Native Americans from voting. After the state judiciary ruled slavery to be unconstitutional, all enslaved persons were freed in 1783. However, although free blacks ostensibly were eligible to vote, they were effectively prevented from doing so. This form of government he hoped would be adopted to govern the nation, although he feared division of the republic into two great parties, each arranged under its leader and concerning measures in opposition to each other. The end of war with Britain solved one set of problems but opened new ones, in particular how to find the revenue to service the huge amount of debt now owed by governments, businessmen, and farmers. Facing high prices and heavy taxes, the farmers of Massachusetts, led by Daniel Shays, rose up against their government. Responding to this threat to order and to the general rise in dissent, John Adams wrote, the just complaints of the people of real grievances ought never to be discouraged and even their imaginary grievances may be treated with too great severity. But when a cry is set up for the abolition of debts, equal division of property, and the abolition of senates and governors, it is time for every honest man to consider his situation. And now, only months before his countrymen would first meet to debate whether to revise the Articles of Confederation or create an entirely different form of national government, John Adams was writing a book on Republican government, titled Defense of the Constitutions of Government. John believed the book was not his best work, but it was widely read and his positions debated extensively. Historian Paige Smith expands on the book's influence. Because of the prestige of the author and the awesome array of authorities quoted, the defense attained at once the stature of a kind of reference work, a source book on government. Perhaps the ideas presented in this book would find their way into the debates getting underway at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. He had completed a second volume and was now working on a third. Upon receipt of a copy of the new federal constitution and the reactions of Thomas Jefferson, he responded, We agree perfectly that the many should have a full, fair, and perfect representation. You are apprehensive of monarchy, I of aristocracy. I would therefore have given more power to the president and less to the Senate. His concerns aside, he supported its adoption. It appears to be admirably calculated to cement all America in affection and interest as one great nation. A result of accommodation and compromise cannot be supposed perfectly to coincide with everyone's ideas of perfection. But as all the great principles necessary to order liberty and safety are respected in it, and provision is made for corrections and amendments as they may be found necessary, I confess I hope to hear of its adoption by all the states. With the new Constitution finally ratified, George Washington was unanimously elected as the first president of the new United States of America by electors from 10 of the 13 original states. He took the oath of office on April 30, 1789. John Adams received the second highest number of votes and became vice president. Adams already had come to identify serious cracks in the Constitution. It is not my election to this office, in the scurvy manner in which it was done, a curse rather than a blessing? Is this justice? Is there common sense or decency in this business? Is it not an indelible stain on our country, countrymen, and constitution? I assure you, I think so. 
The form of democracy emerging in which men of lesser talents and principles, as he saw them, found their way into high governmental positions, pulled John Adams further in support of presidential authority on a level with that enjoyed under monarchy. I am as much a Republican as I was in 1775. I do not consider hereditary monarchy or aristocracy as rebellion against nature. On the contrary, I esteem them both institutions of admirable wisdom and exemplary virtue in a certain stage of society in a great nation, the only institutions that can possibly preserve the laws and liberties of the people. And I am clear that America must resort to them as an asylum against discord, seditions, and civil law, and that at no very distant period of time I shall not live to see it, but you may. What he believed in deeply was meritocracy, but a meritocracy that came from education, self-discipline, high moral character, and a respect for the wisdom of those who had come before. A society can no more subsist without gentlemen than an army without officers. So says Harrington. So says history. So says experience. So says reason. This was the group that put service to their country above gain, and every society needed such a group. George Washington retired after serving eight years as president. Adams and Thomas Pinckney of South Carolina ran against Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr of New York. The election results revealed a fundamental flaw in the new nation's election system. Jefferson received more votes than Pinckney and thus became vice president. The French Revolution, which began in 1789, had triggered the renewal of tensions between Britain and France. After Robespierre and the Jacobins rose to power in 1793, the French mobilized an army of nearly 1.2 million men. War broke out between France and Britain, and the United States under George Washington issued a proclamation of neutrality. John Adams inherited an extremely tense situation with the nation's foreign relations. Fearful of war with France, legislation was passed creating the U.S. Navy. Adams sent a mission to France in 1797 to try to reduce tensions with the French. When the French demanded a monetary bribe in order to meet with Talleyrand, the French foreign minister, relations quickly deteriorated into undeclared war. The French began seizing American ships engaged in trade with Britain. By 1798, Adams and the Federalist majority in Congress passed the Alien and Sedition Acts, which made it more difficult for an immigrant to become a citizen and allowed the government to imprison and deport non-citizens who were deemed dangerous. The acts also made criminal, making false statements critical of the federal government. In response, the legislatures of Kentucky and Virginia passed resolutions declaring the Alien and Sedition Acts were unconstitutional. They argued on behalf of a strong state's rights and strict constructionist interpretation of the federal constitution. The authors of these resolutions were none other than Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. Then in 1799, Napoleon Bonaparte overthrew the French Directory and established himself as First Consul of France. Napoleon forced Spain to relinquish its claims to the territory in North America generally described as Louisiana. The American response to the threat of a powerful French presence would await a new president. All of the domestic and foreign policy issues made the election of 1800 extremely bitter. Jefferson and Burr each received the same number of electoral votes defeating Adams and Pinckney. It then took 36 votes in the House of Representatives before Thomas Jefferson became president. 
From his retirement at the family home in Quincy, Massachusetts, John eventually began to write his autobiography and reflect on all that had occurred during his years of public service. Between 1814 and 1815, he issued 32 letters defending his positions taken in the defense, responding to an attack by John Taylor of Virginia. His most serious concern was over the rise of extremism. To Benjamin Rush, he wrote, When men are given up to the rule of their passions, they murder like weasels for the pleasure of murdering, like bulldogs and bloodhounds in a fold of sheep. Then began the well-known years of renewed friendship and correspondence between Adams and Jefferson with Adams almost always looking to Jefferson to agree in hindsight that the course pursued by Adams in office, if followed, would have better prepared the nation for the challenges to come. To Federalists who wondered how such a relationship was possible, Adams wrote, I do not believe that Mr. Jefferson ever hated me. On the contrary, I believe that he always liked me but he detested Hamilton and my whole administration. Then he wished to be president of the United States, and I stood in his way. So he did everything he could to pull me down. But if I should quarrel with him for that, I might quarrel with every man I have had anything to do with in life. This is human nature. I forgive all my enemies and hope they may find mercy in heaven. Mr. Jefferson and I have grown old and retired from public life, so we are upon our ancient terms of goodwill. Near the end of 1818, Abigail suffered a stroke and died soon thereafter. John lived to see his son, John Quincy, elected president in 1824, and to once again see the Marquis de Lafayette during the Frenchman's visit to the United States. He and Thomas Jefferson survived to the same day, the 4th of July, 1826.